Thanks, Anita. And I, thanks for the invitation to the society. I'd like to thank. Uh, uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> I'd like to thank uh, Karen Bettinger and Iris Spy for their assistance in the process of this. Uh, and Judith McKee Burns, who has been now doing research, actually emailed me some research even this morning as I was getting up. So lots of people have helped with this project. project. Um, like with all of our things, I would acknowledge that we were on hot water in the end. And indeed, this is a story from when I still had cousins alive who remembered the nominee stopping by for a cup of coffee. So not only hot water in the land, but hot water in times as well. I would note up front that this story does involve one incident of suicide, so a full one is full armed on that, so that's that uh, topic. Um, this lady, uh, Emma Ward, is, to put it mildly, not who she appears to be. Uh, let me start in 1881 in Indianapolis. This is the first record we have of Emma Ward. Uh, her, she marries a guy named Ralph Ward. Her name uh, is Emma Estellus, which marries Ralph Ward. He's listed as a blacksmith in the 1880s city directory, living at the Cleveland block. Uh, this is all in a tight circle around the, the monument circle of downtown Indianapolis, Indianapolis in 1881. Maybe because it's now, of um, Even though he's listed as a blacksmith in 1880, we know from his obituary uh, that he had worked as in a rolling mill in Indianapolis and as the owner of a uh, boarding house. The kind of rolling mill in question here is a steel rolling mill. They were making iron rails for, for the railroad. So that fits with the blacksmith part of his uh, uh, designation. And the part about owning a boarding house uh, fits with the fact that in 1882, there's a fire, house, a, a fire in a boarding house. Two people were killed and it's the Lord's boarding house the newspaper article says that it was on Cleveland Street. There wasn't a Cleveland Street in Indianapolis at the time. <coughs> there is one now, for example, the other side of downtown Indianapolis. It's almost sure then that they were talking about the Cleveland Block, not the Cleveland Street. And in fact, the Cleveland Block was on Tennessee Avenue at Kentucky. And one of the other things that this article says that the fire was put out before it had a chance to spread to a tenement on Kentucky. So it seems pretty clear that the guy living in the Cleveland block was in fact the guy who owned the um, boarding house business uh, and that that's the guy that Emma Sue will marry. So those are our folks in Indianapolis in 1881 and 1882. In 1883, the Vandalia Railroad came to Marmont. Uh, I will stress the fact that it only came to Marmont because at that point, Daniel McDonald had not yet gotten his ore in the water to bring the railroad to Plymouth and on eventually to South Bend. It came to Marmont because Marmont was an excursion point for the, the Vandalia thought they could bring people in and turn out the light, bring people in and would enjoy the park and enjoy the lake. The Vandalia owned the park as well as the railroad. So this was an all-inclusive operation for the, for the Vandalia people. Um, the railroad was completed on July 1st. And if I can close in on it here, this little building that eventually became a, a baggage depot at the end of the platform was the original station. Uh, it was not where the depot is now, and it isn't even where the depot used to be. Uh, it was all the way down where the, the um, uh, grain elevator used to be, where the uh, Culver Cove is now. Since they weren't yet committed to going to Plymouth, they didn't see any reason to take the railroad any farther than the edge of their own property at the beginning of the park. So, it was, it was further downtown at, at that point. In any case, the uh, first scheduled train arrives in September. Uh, Center Township has come through with the money, so they're thinking the railroad will go to Plymouth. Uh, and in fact, the extension to South Bend through Plymouth uh, comes in on October 4th and 5th of 1884. So the railroad is relevant because it's that that lures the um, Lord family to move north to Marmont in the first place. Several different newspaper reports about this from different places. One of these is the one that Judy just sent me this morning. Uh, like most newspaper reports in the 19th century, you take them with more than a grain of salt. Uh, two or three different places will report two or three different things. The horsepower of this boat is reported any place from 10 horsepower to 40 horsepower, depending on who you believe. So 
uh, there's a lot of, of uh, stories going around, but it looks as though Ralph Ward found financial backers, probably from the Vandalia Railroad itself, but maybe from other interested people in, in some place like Indianapolis or Logansport, to buy a, everyone calls it time, an ironclad, a steel boat as opposed to a wooden one, which is going to have brought to the lake and put in. And he reaches some kind of a sweetheart deal with the Vandalia Railroad to pick up their passengers and park on the ramp. Now, my cousin Ed Morris already had boats on the lake, so this was a sort of an intrusion. But apparently, the, with the, the railroad actually coming, there was more than enough passenger business to keep Captain Morris and Captain Moore's boat busy. Uh, one of the signs that this was a connection to the Vandalia is the fact that the boat was named William R. McKean, if I can get this up here. And this is William R. McKean, the person, not the boat. Uh, he was a banker, as it says in the picture. The key is he was a banker in Terre Haute, which is where the Vandalia actually operated out of. It was, even though we, at the time and now we told them the Vandalia Railroad, that was a merger name. And the original name, name of the railroad was the Terre Haute in Indianapolis. So McKean was the president of the railroad. Probably the railroad had a hand in paying for Lord to get the boat, and boat name, that Lord named the boat after McKean. So. In 1886, it's going to seem off the point, but it'll become relevant in a minute. <clears throat> the business from the railroad has become big enough that there's starting to be a need for more hotels in town. Uh, one of the first hotels, again, Daniel McDonald. Uh, McDonald and his buddies from Plymouth had built a fishing lodge up on the high ground just at the east end of where the park is now, what we would call the Republic Indian Trail. Uh, and it was for that reason that McDonald wanted the railroad to go from Marmont into Plymouth so he and his buddies could get back and forth more easily to their, their fishing line. Eventually, they sold that lodge to the railroad, so that became a hotel. Other people started opening hotels and boarding houses. And a restaurant that had been across the street from the hotel uh, became the Omer Hotel, owned by a family, not exactly the Hilton's, but they owned two or three different hotels around the U.S. Uh, and converted this place, which had a skating rink and the restaurant, into a 25 room hotel. It would become relevant. Not to be outdone, our friends, the Lords, who after all had experience in the boarding house business, opened a boarding house of their own. And I'll show you on the photo. This is a 1908 map that you'll get the, the general idea. This uh, distinctive angle road running along here is now Lakeshore Drive. Uh, this is State Street, then and now. Uh, the depot uh, then was there, the depot now is down here, so let's move over a little bit. And these two lots, one of them belonging to my great grandfather, William Houghton, and this one belonging to the Ward family, uh, were a little bit of property that my uh, twice great grandfather had not sold to a chap named, named Dylan in Medburn, who made an addition to the North End of Culver. So you can just see a little bit of Medburn's addition there. And then these three lots, one of which uh, Emma Lloyd bought. So, <clears throat> or I should say Ralph Lloyd bought Emma is not a property owner yet. This is a picture of the house uh, as it was being used, uh, very uh, commodious uh, uh, accommodations with uh, all these lovely little trees and stuff like this kind of place. And I'm not sure what angle on the house that picture was taken from, but if you look at this picture of the place as it currently is, my guess is these narrow windows here are the same as the windows that are in the other picture. So they're probably taken from that side of the house. The whole thing has been remodeled so often that it's really hard to tell. The house is still there at the top of what's now part of the So they're back in the business and they have the boat business going. Everything looks to be uh, very prosperous for them. However, Captain Lord apparently drank a lot. And uh, over the winter of uh, 88, 89, uh, there was consideration maybe they could get him into some sort of an institute, but he said, no, no, I can throw out my stuff. Plank was getting better. In uh, late March and early April, they started drinking again. Uh, Dr. Wiseman, the, the local physician, was called in, uh, said, well, I think we can do. And on whatever it was, Thursday or Friday of that week, uh, Captain Lord was seen uh, walking uh, around town with a bit of um, clothesline 
seemed a little odd, but they had stranger things to happen. Uh, and he went down to the, the lake and put a rowboat in. I actually had my cousin Tom Boat and helped him put his rowboat in. And he rowed down to Long Point, where he was seen in the rowboat. Um, and then the next time somebody looked out, the rowboat was floating empty. So they, they got out the grappling hook and, and dragged him out of the pond. It turned out he had dealt himself a fatal wound with a straight razor and then throwed threw overboard a 25 pound weight tied onto the clothesline to his foot. So he wanted to really make sure he was successful in this project. Um, there was a coroner's inquest, which we have the complete records here. Everybody in town was interviewed. It's all written out in, in handwriting and back in the other room there. Um, this is one of the things of where you can't believe what you read in the newspapers. Uh, if you read the newspaper accounts of it, it sounds like you took the, the McKean out under full steam, waited until everyone in the town of Culver or Marmont had collected around him, and then killed himself in full view of, of everyone, whereas <laughs> exactly the opposite is the case. But in any case, the Captain Lord was gone. <clears throat> you might have thought that this would have so, slowed someone down, but not Emma. Uh, in 1890, she buys the or buys the lease of the, the Omer Hotel, and renames it as the Colonnade. The, it's the Colonnade by the second year she, she had the lease. It's she who has the balconies put around it and the lovely little filigree work. So this is is one of the iconic images of Paul. In fact, it's painted on the side of our firehouse. Uh, my friend Jeff Kenny says it's very ironic because if we had a fire department, we would still have the colony in town. But, uh, <laughs> in any case, uh, uh, this is is one of the standard images of Paul, and it's all due to Emma Ward. Uh, she took a, a very plain building and, and gossiped it up for whatever purposes of her, her customers. Uh, nor did she ignore the other parts of her business. Uh, she bought a second boat, a two decker, the Avenari, uh, to add to her little fleet. Uh, and the newspaper reports, because it's called when there's not that much news, uh, that she put in a gravel walk uh, to get up to her, her uh, place. This is the beginning of the parting court, which is now a, a paved street, uh, with just a grass path up to her, her, bed, her I'd say bed and breakfast, the boarding house. And then she eventually puts in this gravel path, gravel path and eventually gets a up with brick. Uh, there is another hotel uh, just down at the bottom of the street, uh, along what's now Lake Shore Drive. And across the street from her was the Kreutzberger uh, Park. So that area today is, is all domestic residences. In the day, it was all hotels and businesses catering to the, uh, the truest uh, trail. So again, she's running two hotels, one of them for a short term, and, and has uh, Captain Crook running the actual boats for her, which might seem a prosperous enough line of work, but, but no. Uh, after seven or eight years of this, she decides that she's going to get into hog farming. I, I said in the PR that it's a dairy farm, it's a back of hog farm, uh, down south of Culver, southwest between Hawk Lake and where Road 17 goes now. Uh, her obituary comments that she actually ran the farm herself, uh, even though she wasn't running, we would probably know this other thing. Uh, she, she would get out on the plow and ride around and, and actually apparently went out to slop the farm herself. Uh, in the course of this, she has the first of what appears to be a series of strokes. She's left partly paralyzed and also at least temporarily blind. So Captain Crook uh, carts her all over for medical treatment, including eventually to Ann Arbor, uh, where she is at least partially uh, healed. Uh, she was, uh, her obituary notes that after the, the incident, she wasn't able to do watercolors anymore, which she had done before, but clearly she could see enough to do business. So she got some of her sight back uh, and was, not so paralyzed that she couldn't move around and continue to be involved in all aspects of trade in Poland. In 1902, she decided to get out of the actual boat business. Uh, so she sells the new Swaggy and the Peerless uh, and a little uh, steam launch or a, a gasoline powered launch she has to uh, Captain Crook for $7,000, which he uh, thinks is an absurd amount of money. We'll come back to that later. I'm told that. Uh, prices from that date to this, you should multiply by about 30, give or take. So north of a couple of hundred thousand dollars for this, this these two boats, maybe three boats, and half the three of the business. Crook tells us, and again, I'll say this in more detail later, but he tells us the reason he paid so much money is that she promised to remember him in, his will, in her will. 
And he may have been a little suspicious about this because he saw the will made out and then wouldn't let her take it home with her. He insisted that she leave it with the attorney rather than taking it out. So maybe he was he knew more than he was letting out. In any case, in 1904, <clears throat> the boat business is doing as well as the boat, and he has to borrow money from it. So he borrows a couple of thousand dollars from Emma and puts a mortgage on the boat. Again, this would be relevant to him anyway. Payable over three years with notes due every September. In 1906, Emma has a second stroke, or at least the second one that we know of. Uh, it's on the afternoon of, of May 20th, but she lingers to the 21st, or so from Saturday evening into Sunday. And uh, people come to see her. Uh, there is a grand funeral. The Ladies' Aid Society <coughs> carry in floral tributes one at a time until the whole of the Methodist Episcopal Church down in, in the, the center of Fall River, the, the north end of the library is now. Is filled with all the floral tributes. Her husband was in the Knights of uh, Pythias, and so the KOP provide uh, people to carry out the uh, uh, pallbearers. bearers. Uh, two ministers come, one of them preaches, one of them gives the service. It's, it's everything. Uh, they say that she probably was known to 10,000 people as a result of her hotel business in Uh And of course, she has this grand tombstone, but I think she's still there. This is in the old part of the center, I think not the side part, uh, telling us. Uh, 1859 to 1906, and we Only 1906 is not a lie. Everything on that is, is false. Uh, <clears throat> she uh, dies without leaving a will. Of course, Captain Cook thinks this is suspicious for all the reasons that we just talked about. Uh, but she dies without leaving a will. And so John Boswell, who's a you know, prominent a local businessman, uh, Boswell is appointed, appointed to be her administrator. And almost immediately, a guy who will, about whom we'll hear much more named James Chubru uh, applies to be the administrator instead. And his reasoning is that she owed him 500 bucks. And the, uh, the law at the time was that the biggest creditor of an estate was entitled to be the administrator. So since she owed him 500 bucks, he gets to be the administrator. Um, exhibit A for this is a handwritten copy of a form that she had filled out promising to pay him $500. And the, the form says that it was due in 1895. And he, he files a second note with the court saying, well, you know, it was a printed form. It said 189 and we forgot to cross out the 189 and write it 190. So just like us with our checks, they had a little trouble with the change of the century. Uh, Buswell argues, and so it takes them all of the rest of 1906 to decide whether Shubru is going to be the administrator of this, this thing or not. What makes it particularly interesting that Shubru might be the administrator is that he was the witness to the will that nobody can find. <laughs> yeah, it's, right, exactly. You hear Perry Mason <laughs> thinking in background. <laughs> so in January, he is appointed <clears throat> as the administrator. And then the lawsuits really start. And you have to read all this time, but I just put it up for, for examples. But basically, everyone that Emma ever owed money to comes forward with the same story, which is that she had promised to remember them in her will. So Captain Crook is not alone. Uh, there were two other people, he says, in the copy of the will that he saw written, that he saw Sugar, the administrator, sign. Um, but there are other people as well, because she had had you know, single lady living in a home. She had various young people whom she would bring in and they would work for her uh, and she would buy them clothes and, and meals and things and say, well, don't worry about not getting a salary, dear. I'll remember you in my will. <laughs> no, well, so everybody is suing, right? <clears throat> and these lawsuits go back and forth over the course of 1907. Um, in particular, uh, Crook gets a hold of an attorney named uh, Capron from over in Fort Wayne, and it just now occurs to me I've never heard his name said out loud. It may have been Kaplan, but I'm going to go with Capron. Uh, he was the son of, he was a Plymouth boy, son of a judge from here in Plymouth, and in fact, he's married uh, down here in the, the graveyard. Crook turns out to be what I think lawyers refer to as a litigious SOB, uh, and this, <laughs> this plays into the, uh, the rest of these affairs. So, uh, 1907 is the year of people suing each other. 1908, is the year of trying to clear everything up. <clears throat> Crook uh, files a third lawsuit. Uh, Shugru has claimed uh, against all this, and, and uh, Shugru is, is himself uh, denied. 
So he then starts to take care of the estate like a good administrator, which involves selling off the property. The first thing to sell off is the big house, which has been assessed at uh, something like $2,400. And then there's all the little pieces. Um, he sells the big house off to a lady named Bush, uh, and then almost immediately has to buy it back from him because he gets an offer from somebody who's willing to pay the full assessed price. Curiously, that lady is Mrs. Crook. What's up with that? I don't know. Uh, but uh, after that breakthrough, uh, then Crook and Sugar are able to reach an accommodation over the mortgage on the boats and the money that's still owed on the notes on, that were secured by the mortgage on the boats. So by September, uh, letters having gone back and forth, by September, uh, Sugar is able to come into court and say, I have a deal with Captain Crook. He will pay the expenses of his lawsuit. Uh, he will release any claims he has against uh, Mrs. Lord. I will release any claims that Mrs. Lord had against him. I'll give him the mortgage papers back. He gets the votes. Everybody's happy. The judge says, you know, good enough for me. And so in September, the, the single biggest lawsuit has been taken care of. They keep selling off these lots over the course of the fall. Uh, it's said that she had 13 lots, but I can't find 13 of them. Um, what she did have, and you can still see the influence of this in Calder today, is that she had bought this row of lots along State Street, which were off to the east of her own property. And she had little cottages and things on there. So if you came to stay at her boarding house and didn't want to stay in the house, there were these little, little places for you to stay along uh, State Street. Uh, what happens is that if you go on State Street today, you see that some houses face one way and some houses face the other depending on whether this is Lord put them in or somebody bought them later. And then she also had these lots along here to the north of where the hotel was down here in Dennis's Lakeshore Drive for that one. Uh, there's also this property over here next to the Revere stand. I have no idea what happened to that. No one mentioned selling it, but obviously we sold it at some point. The estate has uh, some money now, and as a result of selling all this, and moreover, uh, Crook's issues have been taken care of. Uh, he has the boats, he has his mortgage papers back. He's not going to get any more money out of the estate. So he says uh, to his attorney, look, this money is just going to go to, to the state of Indiana because she died without a will. It's going to be as cheat as the lawyer said. So I've been looking through a property, and he's living in the house, right? Says, I've been looking through a property, and I found this old picture. It's her as a young woman, I'm sure. And she told me once that she had taken a trip to Ohio to visit cousins in Dayton. And their name was Waymire or Waremire or something. So if I give you the picture, could you go to Ohio and see if she has any surviving relatives? Because better that they should get the money than Indiana, right? So Capron says, you know, bit between his teeth, off paper on goes, and he must have stopped at everybody in Northwestern Ohio who had a name starting with the letter W. And he eventually gets to um, a little place called Englewood, which is 20 miles outside of Dayton on US 40, if you have the occasion to actually want to go see Englewood. But there's a guy there named W.L. Waymire, and uh, Capron pulls out this picture one more time and says, um, now, I'm, I'm here to talk to you. Sorry. I'm here to talk to you about a, a Miss uh, Emma Estella Lord who died in uh, over in Indiana. And we wonder if you might be a relative of her or know who we could find any relative. He said, wait a minute, I mean, Emma Lord. And Cape uh, Ron produces the picture, and the guy says, But I know who that is. That isn't Emma Lord, that's my cousin Nettie. <laughs> so uh, cousin Nettie, as it turned out, had come to visit his uh, father back in the 1870s. Again, if you believe what the newspapers say, all the usual cautions about believing the newspaper in the 19th century or the 20th century. But in any case, uh, she came to visit my my grand my father back in the 1870s. Uh, she had been orphaned at the age of six. And a nice Quaker family from down in Walnut Ridge, which is in Jennings County, uh, a nice Quaker family took her in and raised her. Moreover, now that he's got it, 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 got
said, no, I didn't know Cape Breton. <laughs> what happened to her? And he said, oh, she lives up in Muncie. Mm -hmm. So Cape Breton gets back. I don't know what he's traveling in a car or a horse car or whatever. He gets back in his, his vehicle and off he goes from Englewood uh, back to um, uh, Muncie uh, and finds this lady who uh, was named Jeanette Hoover. Uh, this is Cape Breton down here in the corner looking very severe. Uh, and I, I, I mean, uh, I said to later, I mean, uh, Medi Estelle Brewer comes, but Jed was over to in a minute. Um, he finds Medi Estelle Brewer. She's uh, a divorcee. She has a teenage child. She's working in, you know, behind the counter in a store in Muncie. And Capron, looking formidable, comes up to her and says, I believe that you are the heiress of a lady who died up in Clover and, and has an estate worth several thousand dollars. Again, multiplied by 30. So this sounds pretty good to, uh, to Maddie Estelle Brewer. Um, and here they are together. Uh, you can decide for yourself whether they, they look a lot alike or not alike. And people at the time at least thought that they were. So uh, this then raises the question of who in the heck was uh, Emma anyway? And this is what we know. Uh, again, uh, full marks to uh, my friend, uh, Mrs. Burns, for helping with this. Uh, she was apparently born, if we believe anything she ever said about anything, someplace around Uniontown, Ohio. Um, though she also says she was born near Dayton, and Uniontown isn't near Dayton, so who knows? She says on her tombstone that she was born in 1859, uh, but people report that she was around 16 or 17 when she married Jason Brewer. Uh, if she was 16 or 17 when she did that, uh, which happened in uh, 1871, we know that for a fact, then she couldn't very well have been born in 1859. She must have been born in 1855 or sometime before that. Besides which, if she had married him in 1871, she'd only been 12 years old. So that seems <laughs> unlikely, particularly since he was 30. It seems a little, somebody would, would have raised an eyebrow or the right to think. Um, the, yeah, well, not necessarily, it's true, <laughs> it's still, uh, it, it's, 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 it seemed a little fishy. Uh, he was a recent, uh, uh, he recently been divorced himself. His wife uh, doesn't die until sometime after 1901. Um, she had, by the way, I should have said, joined the Society of Friends in 1868. It's one of the other places in her, her religious history that we know about. Uh, but she marries in Nightstown, Indiana, this guy, Jason Brewer. And uh, they have a child, Maddie, the Maddie we're going to be talking about, was born in 1873. Uh, Maddie marries a guy named Harvey Commons. They're divorced. They have the son, Robert, and then she marries again after this inheritance business is finally settled in, in 1912. Um, Jason and Nettie separated because Nettie left. More commonly, it's the, in those days, you expect the husband to leave. In this case, Nettie left. The newspaper says it was because she wanted to go to Indianapolis because she was interested in the theater. I am not convinced that 19th century Indianapolis was the place to go if you were interested in the theater, but in any case, she left. This may have been when she made the trip to Ohio, uh, at least it would fit in that time frame. Uh, one newspaper says that she went to Indianapolis, was heartbroken, came back, but then uh, a brewer turns her away, and so she leaves and goes to Ohio, but in any case, she ends back in Indianapolis, and we know uh, because she has to be there in 1881 in order to marry Ralph K. Wood. Why did she change her name to Sewell? That's a good question. Um, the, the one interesting thing about the name change is it change, she changes her name to Emma Estelle Sewell. And of course, her daughter's middle name is Estella. So the, the, the one kind of link we have between mother and daughter, other than resemblance and, and old photos, is this, this preservation of her daughter's middle name in her own forged uh, middle name. But why she chooses to call herself Sewell, uh, the newspapers speculated that um, there was a Sewell boarding house in Indianapolis, and that she had bought the Sewell boarding house and taken the name Sewell along with it when she bought the boarding house. Well, I checked, there was a Sewell boarding house at that for a brief time. There was a Mrs. Sewell, Harriet, who uh, in, in uh, 1877, 1878, is running a boarding house. Uh, it doesn't say that in the city directory under her name, but if you start looking at that address, 
other people are living at that address and see that they're boarders. So we know that Mrs. Sewell ran a boarding house. But Harriet Sewell ran a boarding house, at least apparently because her husband had been spectacularly murdered in Madison, Indiana, the previous year or two years, depending on where we are in the time frame. Uh, John Sewell, who had had a mistress and an illegitimate daughter, or illegitimate son, had been in Madison, and I'm not entirely clear on the details, but the, the mistress may have had, had something with why he was shot, or knifed, actually. Um, and his, his uh, assailant was finally hanged, and the, the Indianapolis papers were full of uh, coverage of this, and that is the very first 19th century uh, newspaper would have been. So it looks like that estate is going to get settled pretty easily. There is the surviving Mrs. Sewell, and then there's her uh, son and daughter-in-law. Uh, but there's some debts against the estate, you know, as there often are. So they go to settle up the estate, and they discover there's nothing there. It turns out there's nothing there because Harriet and the son and daughter-in-law have created a group of fictitious people and siphoned off all the money for the Sewell estate, and then have left and gone to Buffalo, New York. So the, the newspapers love this story as well, but um, the, the boarding house was auctioned off, or it was just foreclosed on, I presume that was auctioned off, for the uh, value the judge set at $14,000. Where Nettie Brewer would have come up with $14,000, again, multiplied by 30, to buy a boarding house in 1878, only to marry some guy who owned another boarding house in 1881, is at least not clear to me. And I suspect that what happened is just that the name was Sewell, the name of Sewell was all over the newspapers, and it was a handy name for Nettie Brewer to pick up. Maybe she was conscious of a little bit of irony there. It's the Sewell family were already a bunch of con men, and so since she's starting a, a new life as a new person, that, that Sewell is a particularly appropriate name for her purposes. I don't know. But in any case, uh, Emma Estella Sewell, she is, and uh, she marries at Ralph Greenwood, as we've been saying. You might have thought that by the end of this year, everything was now ending capital like a Meredith Nicholson story, right? They've identified Maddie as the heir. Her father, uh, Brewer, comes back to testify that this is really his daughter. And apparently there's a reconciliation there because he eventually dies living in her house in Muncie. It just all looks like it's moving along nicely. The newspapers describe it as a wonderful romance in the sense of romance of a novel, you know? Everything has ended up just beautifully. <clears throat> But as I said, Capron doesn't like to let James go. In December, Maddie is declared the heir. Then in 1911, she starts suing everybody. <laughs> uh, she can't undo the property transactions, apparently. Uh, and indeed, she's apparently not interested in owning property in Harvard as long as the estate has the money. But all of those deals that Sugar had made to settle with Crook, who the young people had stayed in the house, all those things that her mother had told those people they would get the money eventually, she sues to get all of that back. She also disapproves of the way Sugar, and not only of the, the, the process of Sugar's administration, but of the fact that Sugar has been charging the estate fees to administer it, which have now added up to a couple of thousand bucks, and moreover has been charging money for his attorney to assist him in administrating a state. So she thinks a lot of, or keep running at least, thinks a lot of money has gone out the door that maybe he'd be able to claw back. So all through 1911, Maddie is filing suits to, to get all this money back. And McConnell, I'm sorry, uh, Sugar, I should say, meanwhile has gone to California, apparently out there, went out there first just to visit family members, but while he's in California, he comes down soon. At first, they think it's liver cancer. Then they think maybe it's something else. They're not exactly sure. But in any case, he can't come back from California. And we have doctor certificates in our files here. Uh, and the doctors who say, well, I've examined him. He's been in California. He's just health is horrible. He can't possibly take a plane trip all the way back to, to the labs of Indiana. So his attorney is a guy named McConnell. McConnell files for a continuance as soon as, as early as May. Uh, saying, uh, you know, my client can't get back in California, my partner's busy with another case, I'm busy with another case, let's continue to the next term of court. And this happens over and over again through the year, it gets into September, uh, Shugru is sick again, he recovered from the liver cancer, but now he's got something else, uh, he still can't travel. Uh, but the economist says, let me just tell you, well, that this, he doesn't speak that way in the court, but he files a legal document that takes approximately that tone, that says we reject every claim against the estate 
And moreover, my, my honorable client, Mr. Sugar, actually made a mistake against himself in the amount of $6 to which we would like to draw the court's attention. So Sugar is, is defending his position to, to the end of this. Um, in November, it looks like they're finally going to get a court here in, in, in the 27th of November. Uh, lots of people got uh, summonses to come and speak. My, my uh, great grandmother, Mrs. Houghton, H O T E N, in the, the, the summons, gives a summons, which again we have a copy of, uh, inviting her and all of her neighbors to come and testify about this. Uh, and it looks like there's going to be a trial. Everyone's ready for there to be a trial, and the attorneys cancel out again. Um, it gets postponed till the end of December. And so at the end of December, uh, the, there's testimony heard someplace between November and December. Uh, even Capron himself takes the stand, which is fairly unusual to be one of the attorneys to take the stand as, as a person testifying. We'll see why it's important in a minute. Uh, and at the, the end of the meeting in December, the attorneys come in to Judge Benita and say, we've reached an agreement to postpone it until sometime next year, until 1912. And the newspaper is very dramatic about this. Judge Benita takes out a piece of paper and says, I have a decision that if you want to wait until next year to find out what it is, you can wait, I'll put it in my pocket and I'll tell you in March what it was that I decided. <laughs> so they decide they're gonna wait. Uh, and in fact, uh, in the meantime, Shugru dies, of whatever it was or was not liver cancer, he dies. His administrator now, so this is Shugru's administrator, Shugru of all people died without a will. Um, Shugru's <laughs> administrator, <laughs> Files to be the administrator for Emma Lord's estate because the admin, he's the administrator for the last administrator. And apparently, the judge says, by now it's the 18th of March, the judge says, just hold your horses down. And they all come in on the 21st, and the judge unfolds his paper and says, Look, uh, Marsha Bayless, uh, one of the people had a claim here. She had a claim for 100 bucks. I'm holding up that claim. She's entitled to that. Um, two of the other people, Jonas Smith and Adam Butler, who got small amounts of money. Uh, uh, Maddie Cummins decided to settle with them out of court, so they're they're out of the discussion. Captain Crook, uh, with the, the mortgages on the boats, this is the single largest amount of money in the thing, uh, and the judge says, well, I've listened to all the testimony here, with the, the at, at attorney Capo, I've listened to all the testimony here, and I'm satisfied that, that was a fair deal. It might have been possible that Crook would have lost the, the suit, but then again, it might have been possible that Crook would have won the suit, so it made sense for the, the administrator to, to try and start, strike a deal. And it certainly made sense for the court to approve it, which by the way, I did. <clears throat> so the, the crooks business is thrown out. Then the judge says, now let me turn to this business of these, these high flying out of town people with their attorney fees. <clears throat> and he says, Shukru had claimed $2,000 to be the administrator. I'm going to last $681 and 35 cents. So that's a little over $1,300 back to the estate. As attorneys, fancy pants, they had charged $1,500 and then allowed them $698. That's another $802 back to the estate. And somebody here has a charge for $17 for posting notices. I'm not going to allow that either. So altogether, $2,137.65 come back into the estate in addition to whatever other money, uh, other money Maddie had got out of it. So she comes out pretty well. I don't know what slice of that keep on took for, for working as an attorney, but she comes out head for all of her losses. Capron himself, however, the well, I should mention, Maddie is also named as the administrator of the lawyers that say they only snow and administrate uh, for everything that hasn't been done yet. So she's the cleanup hitter of the administrators. Anything that hasn't been taken care of, she can take care of by herself. So that's all right. But then the judge sort of looks at Capron and says, now, young man, I have, I have a few words for you. Your lawsuit on behalf of Ms. Commons here uh, against Captain Crook and his allegation about a will depended on the claim that Crook and, and the banker who had drawn up the will uh, were perpetuating a fraud on the court because they were defending a will that never existed. And what strikes me as odd about your standing here and testifying to the idea that it was a, a will that never existed is that you were the attorney for Cape Ron when it came into court in the first place. You came on the attorney for, uh, for Crook when it came into court in the first place. 
So either you were lying then or you were lying now, which do you think it is? <laughs> Capon is, is flustered and, and uh, the judge says, I will reserve judgment and we'll talk about this later. I don't know that he ever did talk about it later, but uh, that was the, the final end of the estate with a slight embarrassment of the attorney who had been the, the motivating factor of the activity. So there you are. Uh, that's uh, Emma Ward. Heaven only knows what she would have done if she had lived longer. But that's the, the story as far as I know. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's a little tangled. <laughs> But you did a great job of untangling. Oh, thank you very much. I was, I, I was able to follow, and that's that's pretty good. Um, I just have one more quick announcement. It's for next week's brown bag. There are schedules for the rest of the year right here if you want one. But next time is going to be Joe Kent, and he is an antique dealer and appraiser. And so, um, you know, all we've been hearing while we're getting ready for our sales, well, I'm I'm downsizing. I'm getting rid of stuff. And another thing that I hear from my friends a lot is my kids don't want it. <laughs> so um, if you're in that position, which I think I just heard you are, um, and you have things that you would like to have value, he is going to do a few. So uh, to be fair to him, um, he would like for us to get a picture and a description ahead of time. And then he will select um, some to evaluate, kind of like Antiques Roadshow. He is going to talk about how to value things on your own. So I think it's going to be really fascinating, and I hope you can make it. It's August 12th at noon, and so uh, just wanted to give you a heads up on if you have something you want to have value. You can email me or call, and I'll talk to you and give you my email. Okay. Thank you, and we're so glad you were here. And thank you, John. Oh, thank you. Any last minute questions? Three years as a teacher, I was asked questions. Yes. Okay, I've only lived in this county for 50 years, but I never heard of Marmont. Where the heck is that? Oh, right. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's still there. It, well, yes, it is. So when my, um, I mentioned the nominee. Uh, when Culver was first laid out, Culver is in section 16, which local historians know uh, had to be sold for school land, right? So when the school lands at section 16 were sold off, it was it, because the lake takes a big chunk out of it. Um, it was divided into four uh, quarters, each a quarter of a square mile, but only one of them was a real quarter of a square mile, but the others were on the same property. So that western quarter of a square mile, which runs along what's now School Street, and then School Street turns into an alley and goes on down. That bit was bought by um, uh, Bayless Lewis Dixon. Uh, who uh, probably coincidentally the next year became the son-in-law of the school commissioner uh, who had sold the land, uh, John Hope. Uh, so um, the the Dixons actually get out of the, the owning of that piece of property pretty quickly, uh, but not before they take the bottom, bottom part of it and create a town called Uniontown. So Bayless Dixon found Uniontown at the south end of this quarter mile if you go into downtown Culver today and find what is until September 1st still our doctor's office, across the street from it, there's a parking lot. And that parking lot is the southwest corner of this, this little town of Uniontown. Um, Bayless Dixon, as I say, he founds the town in 1844 uh, and then gets religion. He becomes a preacher over in Argus. Uh, his widow lives until 19. 13 or 1914, she's a pioneer daughter and lives well in the 20th century. Uh, so uh, is this this triple book lady who looks like you know an older version of Queen Victoria, but still has her faculties of writing letters to my, my twice great grandfather at that manhood. Uh, in any case, uh, he, they, the Dixons, get out of the business of, of owning the town and they they sell it to <coughs> their cousins, John Houghton and his, his sons, who pass it around like monopoly. Uh, back and forth and back and forth, uh, particularly when John Hurt is also the first treasurer of Marshall County, becomes the first bankrupt in Marshall County. Uh, his sons buy the property and then at, at the sheriff's sale and sell it back to Dan for a buck. So, so John Hurt gets the property, goes back and forth. Eventually, they decide that they don't want to try and turn that whole quarter mile into a town. They sell the northern two thirds of it to their cousin, my, my twice great grandfather named Thomas. 
which is confusing because everybody else in the family is named Thomas as well. But in any case, Thomas takes it and it's a sort of an L at the bottom of this farm, which is at 17 Road. Uh, and then the southern part of it, because now they've sold it, they, they resurvey it. And at that point, there's we're now up to 1857. Uh, there's a local resident who was a fan of a, of a French field marshal named Marmont, who was just died. Uh, and so uh, this guy, Dr. Durer, is actually a, a doctor from the pharmacist. Dr. Durer suggests, why don't we change the name of Marmont? You know, every third village is named Union Town, and nobody else is named Marmont. They change the name to Marmont, and it's Marmont until they change it to a suck up the Henry Harrison building. So Marmont is an earlier name. It's really not there anymore. Well, everything is there except the name. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the town is still there. My, my license plate says Marmont. Someone saw that name. I came out of Lucretia's and uh, saw two people staring at the back of my car. And I said, well, nobody really was. I said, you know, I put, I jumped. Uh, and uh, they both looked up, saw me, and they said, oh, it's your car. <laughs> Who else would have a mom on my Anything else? Yes, sir. When did the uh, Vandalia Railroad cease? Do you have to recall? It, well, it was, it was, uh, it had always been a long distance Pennsylvania uh, subsidy, I mean, yeah. subsidiary. And so I think the last scheduled train off the top of my head was in 19, okay, was in 1940-something. Then they ran a couple of, of special duty trains after that. But the last passenger train, uh, the, the railroad itself lasted until the, the collapse of the Penn Central. Yeah. Okay. But I remember it running down. Through. Sure, sure. I, I, uh, one, of the, one of the things that's very distinctive is that since it ran diagonally, you can tell all the places between here and Holber mm -hmm. uh, where the Vandalia went. In particular, the, the statue of Chief Menominee, I was explaining to somebody the other day, is where it is, not because that's where Menominee's village was. Menominee's village was up where the aggregate business is there on Peach Road. It's a Peach or Pear, anyway. Peach. Peach. Uh, up on Peach Road. But the statue was there, partly because that's where Danny McDonald could get, get the property, but also because that's where the railroad was. Mm -hmm. So to get off the railroad, and there was the statue right in front of it. Okay, so there you go. Yeah, I remember at the beach, down there as a family and stuff in the train with. I don't know what was all. I think it was just freight. Yeah, I was actually just freight. Yeah, yeah. One of the last uh, freight trains to come through Culver, uh, I discovered, uh, was that the the funeral home had caskets delivered by by train, and there was there was a little a very low trestle overpass uh, between the park and the uh, the feed mill, and uh, the owners of the funeral home would would, would back up a, a truck under the trestle so they could just unload it. Coffin out the side of the, the rail car and straight into the truck and we're dragged up to the funeral. Home, so there you go. Anything else? Thank you all. Have a good day.